Don't do anything to exclude God from some part of the marriage to say to God that there is something that we won't offer to you or receive from you. That's what contraceptives ultimately do is they, the couple is not intending this, you, probably, but the very act of using them is saying to God, there's something that we don't want you to have part in. We want to exclude you from some part of our life together. Uh, contraception by its very nature does this when it seeks to separate marital love from the possibility of children. Welcome to Tulsa Time with Bishop Condola. I'm Adam Minahan. It has been a crazy last three, four weeks. We've been very busy since the last time we've recorded. Uh, between, we had convocations for the priesthood. We had a USC, or not we, you had a USCCB uh, meeting in um, Flo no, Orlando. Orlando, I was going to say Florida, yeah. Disney World. <laughs> and, and then, uh, you know, we had a crazy uh, storm that happened that that came through eastern oklahoma the 100 mile an hour winds powers went out internet's been down um chaos has ensued <laughs> yeah. people buying ice did you know that what i went over to uh try to get some ice for my my parents because their their power went out and we were you know putting a bunch of meat in there and uh at three gas stations that i went to all of them sure. completely out of that yeah. ice or gas and gas yeah gas was also another one for generators and everything those else. that were still open i mean many of the qts and all were closed themselves yeah like yeah power the CBS, either out of right. gas or out of electricity to pump it so that's right yeah yeah, yeah. or deliver it yeah um so, yeah we had right after the last episode that we filmed we had our annual priest convocation We've been doing this for all the years that I've been here now. Um, a summer time of about four days together. In the last couple of years, we've been doing it at a place called Shangri-La out on uh, Lake Grove. Not, not Lake Grove. What's Grand, Lake. Grand, Grand Lake. Grand Lake. Yep. And um, the, the purpose of the convocation is just to give the priests an opportunity to spend time together typically focused on a topic. This year we had Father Michael Champagne, who is a member of a community in Lafayette, Louisiana called... Mm, uh, the Crucified Lord? Yeah, Community of the Crucified Lord, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and he came and spoke to us about the virtues in the spiritual life of a priest. And so, you know... Faith, hope, and love, prudence, temperance, justice, fortitude, those virtues, how do they play themselves out in the life and ministry of a priest? But, you know, a big part of the the convocation and the fruit of it is simply for the men who don't get to see each other that often to be able to be together. Mm -hmm. uh, think of all of our men in the southern part of the diocese. They're 30, 40, 50 miles apart and more from each other and uh, busy with multiple parishes. And so... Uh, and if you're in in Tulsa, for example, you might be in a large parish where you're so busy that you don't get to go and see the guys in a neighboring parish that often. So it's just really good for priestly fraternity, priestly morale, to be able to have this time together just to, you know, there's, there's the talks and things, so it's quasi like a retreat, but we also celebrate Mass and the, the office. But then there's also uh, boats, you know, one of the... Uh, local couples who have a big boat on the lake brought the boat and guys go out on the boat. Oh, that's awesome. Um, yes. There's a place there at the resort that has uh, like shuffleboard and games and billiard tables and all these things. So fun things for, for guys to do. Golf yeah. course there, you know, biking yeah. trails, all of that. So, so that went on and no sooner than that is over, the, the bishop's summer meeting began in Orlando, Florida this year. So the fall meeting is always at the same hotel in Baltimore. Um, and that's sort of the main session. That's mm -hmm. our main working session. Mm -hmm. 
the summer meeting is designed to be a little bit more laid back in terms of the work, providing more opportunity for guys to spend time together and so forth. Um, we were at a big hotel, you know. I went with another bishop over to the Kennedy Space Center on oh, Monday cool. before it all started. And so guys were in doing stuff like that. Um, <laughs> we tend to be work workaholics anyway, no matter you try to make it more laid back. The committee meetings use the opportunity of when the bishops are all together somewhere to have committee meetings. So I was in pre-meetings of the Committee on Protection of Child, Youth, and Young Adult, and then on the Healthcare Subcommittee and the Lady Marriage, Family, Life, Youth Committee all had pre-meetings. The first day of our meeting together the of, of the bishops is always now a prayer morning. So hmm. we just have a, a couple of hours of adoration, confessions are available, uh, ended with celebration of the Eucharist. One of the bishops offers a reflection. And that's really been very wonderful for us. It really sets a, a tone for our meeting. But uh, the meeting itself was a, a lot of uh, updates on reports and activities that are going on, the Eucharistic Congress, the Synod process. Um, and we're looking at updating some of our documents that help guide ministry throughout the country, the document on the laity, the ethical and religious directives for Catholic health care, okay. uh, an update to that document. It's something like 45 years since we've had an update to the document on uh, persons with disabilities. Mm. So it's time to reassess the landscape and try to bring that more up to date. So a lot of that kind of work was going on. A group of us left the hotel on Saturday morning to get to the, ho the airport and to go to different flights. And then the texts started. Delayed, delayed, mm -hmm. change of gate, this and that. Mm -hmm. So I did not get out of, you know, I got there at about nine in the morning. I did not get out of Orlando till three on a flight to Denver. Uh, the original the flight was supposed to be to Houston. <laughs> uh arrived in denver didn't get on a flight out of there for tulsa till nine got here just in time for the wind to hit so the airport was shut down baggage was shut down we couldn't get bags wow. i found the most intrepid uber driver in the world <laughs> at 12 20 in the morning who answered the call to come to the airport and pick me up it took about an hour and a half to get from the airport to the chancery because wow. of, you know, 169 was closed at a certain point. We had to turn around and go all the way back the other way in the wrong lane. Oh, man. That would be uh, wild. Well, Going down 169. If you done it by yourself, it's really scary. But right. when the whole line of traffic has turned around, it's going to It's like, way. yeah, sure. But... Um, you know, trees down and roads closed, and uh, oh gosh, it was a mess. Yeah. yeah. So I gave him a very good tip. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now I, I would I'd be curious on you'd get into the you know Uber car, and obviously you're you have your clerics on. I'm assuming, and like, I didn't. Oh, you didn't at that time. Okay, so did he he had no idea you were you were bishop. Mm -mm. Okay, because I think that would probably uh, yield some interesting conversations as you get as you get in there. Yeah, normally I fly uh, wearing clerics. But I had an accident in the restaurant ah. the day before as we were having our Jesu Caritas meeting. We had lunch first, and I spilled iced tea on my pants. Ah. <laughs> so then I had to move to my blue jeans ah. This is my backup. Now, I, I have to apologize. My manners was, were not very good uh, for, for this episode because we didn't actually introduce formally introduce our guest with us th today. Um, so I apologize, Sister, for not introducing you at the very beginning. But we have Sister Maria Josefa with us today from the Sisters of Mercy. It's great to have you here with the, on Tulsa Time. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, we're really excited to to have you and and, and have you as a guest. And um, I was reading a little bit about like trying to do a little bit of research before our, our episode. And I talked. Uh, I have a 
um, I love for Sister uh, Catherine is uh, McCall. Calcutta, Macaulay. Macaulay. I was going to say Calcutta. I was like, nope, that's not right. Um, uh, Macaulay. Different saint. Yes, different saint. Uh, because I had a chance to pray at her tomb in yeah. Ireland, um, and so um, that was me and my wife did. And so anyway, I was I was doing a little bit of research on 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 you, and I thought I, I was reading your uh, vocation story, and I was like, man, this is an awesome vocation story. I'd love uh, you to share it with us. So we wanted to bring you on and uh, hopefully get a two parter out of out of the deal, and have you on next week as well. But um, maybe a little bit about who you are and, and, and your calling. Well, maybe before that, just to contextualize the RSMs at all. I mean, many sure. people in, in, who will see this won't know who your community is and what you do in Tulsa. So you might just introduce us to that. Sure. I'd be happy to. So um, the community I'm a part of is called the Religious Sisters of Mercy of Alma, Michigan. Our mother house is up in Michigan. Um, but we do have a convent here in in Tulsa. We've mm-hmm. been here 20 plus years, I would say. And we recognize as our original foundress, uh, Mother Catherine McCauley, who began the Sisters of Mercy in the 1830s in Dublin, Ireland. Um, and and the Sisters of Mercy spread throughout the world. And then our particular community um, was a, a branch off of one of the um, I guess, provincial aides or something like that in Michigan in the 1970s. And so we're just this year in September, we'll be celebrating our 50th anniversary as a community. Awesome. Yeah. So that's, that's great. But um, really called as a community to be um, an image of, of the mercy of God. So we wear, a lot of people kind of see our crosses and they're drawn to them. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's really the the white of the cross is meant to symbolize the mercy of God and the black to symbolize the misery of mankind. And so Look, we it's have... It's bigger than mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't wear it to compete with you. <laughs> um, but yeah, so just God's mercy, which the darkness does not overcome. And we don't actually have a corpus on our cross. It's not a crucifix because we see that each sister is called to be um, that convergence point between Mm. the mercy of God and the misery of mankind. Mm. Recognizing, of course, that we ourselves are the first recipients of his mercy, and and from that receiving of his love and mercy, we we are given the strength to go out and and bring that to others. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah, we're very blessed in the diocese to have you here. We have relatively few religious communities in the diocese, and uh, they all do uh, tremendous good work, and we appreciate so much having them. Um, your community has a wide array of of uh, apostolate apostolic activities, and so the primary one you do here with us is hospital work, but other things as well. Huh? Branching out, yeah. So, um, you know, as a community, we are um, we see as our apostolate. Um, comprehensive health care. And so just care of the whole person. So kind of the two major branches of that are our education and health care. But but in a in a um I mean we have in education we have sisters in adult faith formation at the diocesan levels. We have um sisters in grade schools, in seminaries, and so kind of in administration, um kind of the whole gamut, and then healthcare as well, sisters as nurses advanced practice providers, physicians, um, social workers, things like that. And a lot of sisters also in, you know, as delegates for religious within dioceses or kind of serving in, in different capacities mm-hmm. across all the dioceses in which we we live and serve. So um, here in Tulsa, our convent is actually located at St. Francis Hospital at the Yale campus. And we have currently eight sisters assigned to our Tulsa convent, which is one of our larger convents. Mm-hmm. Um, and five of us work somewhere within the St. Francis Health System as um, kind of in ministry or as physicians or um, in the legal department, so kind of a, a wide variety there. Um, but we also have, as of two years ago, I think this is we're mm-hmm. kind of at year two, um, have two sisters at Bishop Kelly High School as well. Mm-hmm. So Sister Mary Hannah is the president of the school, and then Sister Mary Alicia has been teaching both math and Theology, primarily theology, but she was a fill-in for math this year too, and mm. and did a great job. And then we have one other sister who's a philosophy professor 
at the University of St. Thomas um, in Houston in a distance learning program for the St. John Paul II Institute down there. So, oh, yeah. yeah. That's fascinating, too. She does that from here. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. So yep. that's fascinating. Yeah. Um, I was also so fascinated by <laughs> when you had the sister here who was the surgeon. Yes. And one of the sisters was a surgeon. And you certainly don't typically run into a, a religious sister who's a surgeon. Mm -hmm. She told me some stories about being in the scrub room <laughs> with other physicians who suddenly realize there's, an, <laughs> there's, no, there's <laughs> nothing here. I'm not scrubbing up. Yep. Yep. Yeah. 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 She's our only surgeon, um, but but she's done a lot of great work. So. Well, I mean, your whole community has, uh, you know, Sister Mary has done great work at Bishop Kelly, and you guys obviously have really helped with the St. Francis uh, Hospital, and we're excited to, to talk a little bit about that, I hope maybe next episode. Uh, but I, I'm curious on how you discerned in your calling of, 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 of becoming a nun, of, of joining the Re Religious Sisters of Mercy. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So it's kind of funny, you get these stories I asked all the time, and you, you get kind of a short version and a long version, and you kind of adapt in between. But um, I grew up Catholic. Um, and Where? In Austin, Minnesota. Oh. Well, I was born in Rochester, I guess, but southeastern Minnesota. Okay. Not a um, thick accent. Not a thick it's, Minnesota accent. It's there when I say boat. Uh, oh, okay. There <laughs> it is. <laughs> okay, or there flag. it is. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> or flag. <laughs> it does come out, but it's funny. You know, down here people hear the accent a little bit. When I go back to Minnesota, I I feel like my family has accents. So yeah. I've lost it somewhat, okay. um, being further south. Okay. But it's there. It's steep. So <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So I grew up in a Catholic family. My dad was a cradle Catholic. My mom converted when she and my dad got married. Hmm. Um <clears throat> And we went to Mass every Sunday, and I grew up going to Catholic schools. And, you know, it just provided a solid foundation. I wouldn't say as a kid I had a strong devotional life. You know, we, I kind of I went to Mass, you know, for the all-school Masses and things like that, and we always went to church on Sundays. But I didn't have a strong sense of the liturgical calendar or different saints or— um, you know, all of that, but the sacraments were there all of my life, which I think just provided that foundation for God to work. Mm. And I remember when I was nine, I think, you know, it was kind of third, fourth grade, somewhere in there. I had kind of a high window in my bedroom, and I was standing on my bed before I went to bed, and I liked to look out at the stars. And I remember promising God that I would be a sister when I grew up. Well. And I don't remember why, you know, because I wasn't taught by sisters. We didn't, mm -hmm. at that point, have sisters really in the school any more than I was going to. Um, I didn't know sisters, really. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I mean, maybe it was like Sister Act had just come out. And, <laughs> you know, like, who, who knows what it was? The Lord uses everything. But I remember making that promise to God, and I remember the sense of peace that it brought. Mm -hmm. And then I just went to bed, and I don't remember anything else. I mean, it's not like I remember God's voice booming in my ear saying, you should do this, or or what what the conversation I was that I was having with the Lord at age nine, but I did make that promise. And it kind of bothered me in the years that followed that I never was able to forget it, mm -hmm. you know, because then you, like, you get into junior high and high school and college, and you're like, no. I want to get married. No, I want to have children. And you kind of develop all these other plans you want to do with your life. And I thought that it was kind of unfair of God that he wouldn't let me forget this promise I made to him, you know, that before before I knew any better, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just didn't move on it for like two decades, roughly. <laughs> and um, I, in the meantime, I had graduated from college and then I went back to become a nurse, and I'd been working as a nurse for a few years at Mayo, mm. one of the Mayo hospitals, St. Mary's campus. And um, I went back to visit my parents on kind of a, a weekday off, and my dad and I went to Mass, and he took me out for coffee afterwards, and he said, you know, can I just ask you something? I don't want to offend you. He's a very gentle, spirited man. I don't want to offend you, but I've just been wondering, you know, if maybe the reason you haven't met your Mr. Right is that Jesus is your Mr. Right, hmm. you know? Wow. 
Wow. And and you need to consider the possibility of a religious vocation. So, did he know about your promise? You're not no, 9 years old? No. And that's the thing. I mean, that's part of what kind of pushed me into actually discerning because you know, of course I started crying and 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 I said, "Well, actually, yes, I have thought about that for like 20 years almost, you know, <laughs> and like I've had this uncomfortable feeling that I can't get rid of that I do have a vocation. And, um, but I had never, I never told my parents that I made that promise. I never told my friends that I made that promise. I might have mentioned it, you know, like you kind of send out those little balloons, you know, like, like, oh, wouldn't it be funnier? I should just become a nun or, you know, like, but but never in a way that's serious, you know, you just kind of are like gauging how your friends would respond. And mm-hmm. um, so really, I mean, in effect, I never told anybody. But then there was my dad who, you know, as I like to say, of all the people on earth is one of the few that knows me the best and loves me the most and wants me to be happy. And mm-hmm. I mean, both my parents are wonderful, but um, and he saw it with me, you know, and so I just knew that I either had to give it an honest look or just tell the Lord no, because I couldn't really walk the fence any longer. Mm. So that was sort of that was sort of the thing that really got me into looking at religious life. And my dad knew of our community. We had a, a community um, in the Diocese of Winona, Rochester, and he didn't know the sisters there, but he knew we were there and he knew we were in healthcare and he thought maybe that would be a good place to start. So mm. Um, I got the the contact information for the local superior there, and I called her, and I just said, I'm just barely open to the idea of a religious vocation, but <laughs> can I come and visit? Because I feel like I, I won't be peaceful if I, if I don't <laughs> at least give it a look. Um, so I went, and um, I it was wonderful. I was there for about three days, and um, I— went to the clinic with the sisters and I saw patients with them and I went to the nursing home with them to see patients and I gardened with them and I cooked with them and I prayed with them and I went to mass with them and I just kind of felt like one of them except that I wasn't and I loved it. And where I was staying was actually at the clinic that the sisters had then and it had a chapel in it and nobody else was staying there except for me. Mm-hmm. Um, when the clinic was closed. And so the superior had just said, you know, if you want to get up in the middle of the night and use the chapel, you'll be the only one there. So so I went into the chapel, and um, I was really having a sense that this is what the Lord was asking, because it's the first time I, I saw in my life really um, the possibility of the vocation, of, of sort of reconciling like these natural kind of feminine desires to have a family, to care for people, to live in community um, with with religious life. It's the first time I could really see those two coming together. And so I just said, okay, Lord, if this is what you want, then then I'm yours, you know? And I just felt that same sense of peace come back, you know, that I remembered mm-hmm. from age nine. And like, I knew who it was that was giving it that. And it's kind of, those are the only two times in my life that I've really felt that same kind of presence, but I just knew that it was his blessing on it that, mm-hmm. yeah, move and move now, <laughs> basically. Yeah. You know, we've waited long enough. <laughs> He's very patient, but but he it was time to go. So so the next summer I entered. That was in the f- late fall, and then okay. I entered the following July. Went went to the mother house on a vocation weekend that spring. Didn't like it as well was kind of wondering what to do next because I really felt like the Lord was asking me to enter. And um, anyway, I just sort of prayed about it. And and he kind of helped me to see that when I was in Minnesota with the sisters and really felt like one of them, that's when it felt right. And when I was at the mother house as a very welcome guest on a vocation weekend, it didn't feel right. It didn't feel right to be a guest. Mm. So hmm. that's what it was. I didn't end up looking at any other vo- I mean any other um, religious communities. I just thought, well, the Lord wants me to be happy, and He's not the type of God that jerks your chain around. He doesn't. He doesn't want to confuse me. I knew that. 
Um, so it was just kind of a time to take a leap of faith and say, okay, mm-hmm. I think this is what you want. I'm going to do it. Mm-hmm. If it's not right, I trust you to let me know. But it was right. Mm-hmm. Never looked back. And how long, so how long is your, I guess, the, the, is it called novitiate or like your, your years? Like our formation yeah, program? formation program. Eight years. Eight typically. years. Typically. Okay. Yeah. So it can vary a little bit depending on the sister, but typically we have about one year of postulancy. That's the first year of mm-hmm. kind of basic formation. Um, and then a two-year novitiate. Okay. Um, the first year is cloistered kind of, it's just at the mother house, um, just in service to the, to the common life. And then the second year you get missioned to one of our other convents and then five years of temporary vows Mm. before you can request to make perpetual profession. So there's time to Mm -hmm. pray about it, to receive the formation you need to really be able to make that wholehearted choice. Is there a specific educational goal during that time or? Yeah, I'm, Yes, there is. There's there's a formation program. So the sisters, especially in postulancy and novitiate, they take classes provided by the community or our friends and um, like St. Thomas Aquinas and kind of Thomistic thought and theology and church history and yeah. Latin and um, I forget what all they study. But so there's that. And then the other part of it is really learning what it means to be a religious sister of mercy. So right. learning the history of Mother Catherine, learning um, learning our spirituality, learning our community's history, um, learning how to live in the common life, mm-hmm. um, learning what it means to be a vowed woman, you know, mm-hmm. to um, have professed those evangelical counsels of poverty, chastity, and obedience. And then for us, we take a fourth vow of service Mm. to the poor, sick, and ignorant. So just kind of living that life mm-hmm. um, and and coming to understand it and study that more, kind of what that means in the mm. church. So so how did you land here in Tulsa? Um, so I was, when I entered the community, I was at the mother house for the first two years, which is pretty typical. Mm-hmm. And then I was missioned to St. Louis for about three and a half years and served in the archdiocese there. And I started... Uh, a master's program to become a nurse midwife when I was in St. Louis. And then I got reassigned to Tulsa, Mm. kind of in the middle of those studies. And so I've been here about five and a half years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so the sisters, depending on, you know, after the basic formation, you're not necessarily pursuing everyone pursuing a uh, undergraduate degree or something. But then after the the profession, you can choose other further studies. Is that how it? Yeah. So um, typically in postulancia novitia, there wouldn't be any like um, formal outside studies, right. you know, for a, a career, right. if you will. Um, some sisters come and they enter and they've already graduated college right. or have some kind of advanced degree. Um, some will enter having right out of high school or having had just a couple years of college and then decided to enter. So we, we kind of get women at all stages. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the study or kind of a sister being asked to study, it's, it's primarily an obedience given, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, that's really, you know, mother will say, you know, we need a sister in this area. I'd like you to study this. Right. But it's a conversation as well, sure. you know. So when I entered, I kind of like to tell this story. She, um, the vocation directress at that time, was talking about just this kind of dialogue, this formative dialogue that occurs between the superior and the sister. Um, and I was saying, you know, I, I told mother that I would I would study whatever she wanted me to study, but that it would be helpful for her to know that I faint at the sight of blood, you know? <laughs> so, like, maybe don't send me to medical school, mother, because, like, I'd be unconscious most of the time, you know? Like, but you were already a nurse. I was already a nurse, yeah. So how did you deal with that? With not being in nursing? No, with nope. not seeing blood. You were oh, no, no, no. I, I don't faint at the sight of blood. The, the vocation directress was telling me <laughs> that she— she faints at the sight of oh, okay. So she was trying to explain to me the, the process of this kind of dialogue that happens that, <laughs> yes, it's an obedience, but there's also conversations that happen okay. oftentimes. There I gotcha. These so kind she of back, was saying to the mother. He was yeah. saying to our mother general, mother, 
I faint at the sight of blood. So, <laughs> like, send me back to school where you will, but, you know, maybe not in the medical field. So, I don't faint at the sight of blood. Okay. That's funny. At least I haven't yet. When I first arrived, there was sister, is her name Rafka? Or Ra Rafka. Rafka. She yeah. was just finishing her pediatric residency, I mm -hmm. think, at, at yep. uh, St. Francis. Yep. But I think she was only here another year or so, and then she went off to wherever she's... Yeah, yeah, she's actually back up in Michigan now, okay. um, working at a clinic called Cristo Rey. Mm -hmm. It's uh, part of Catholic Charities for the Diocese of Lansing. So. But, uh, you know, finishing a residency, I presume there's, what, six years or something of of schooling ahead of that, huh? So she's... Yeah, so she entered... Um, Again, we get sisters at all stages. She actually had finished medical school, mm. but not done residency yet. Right. So she, um, you know, was able to enter right after graduating medical school. And then she's actually in my class. We entered the same year. Mm -hmm. um, and so we went through postulancy and novitiate together. Yeah. And then when we were missioned as second year novices, I went to St. Louis. She came to Tulsa right. and then started her residency in pediatrics. Yeah. Yeah. And the philosopher here now, sister, what's her name? Is? Mary Veronica. Mary Veronica, that's a PhD, huh? So that's a lot of schooling after. It is. Yeah. And it's actually as part of the spirituality of our community. Um, early on, Mother Catherine McCauley, um, you know, at the time when the Sisters of Mercy were being founded, Ireland was coming out of kind of the British penal laws, in which, under which, you know, Catholics were... Um, not allowed to really own businesses, to own land, to have their own schools, to, you know, there was, so the Catholic population was pretty severely uneducated and um, like underemployed and um, kind of a very vulnerable population, poor population. And um, Mother Catherine just, you know, by providence, her, you know, her, by that time her parents had died. Um, she had been sort of taken in and lived with a Quaker couple for, hmm. for, couple decades, I think it was, and they hadn't been able to have any children. Mm. And so when they died, they left their fortune to her. And with that, she was able to found Bagot Street as this kind of home of mercy for um, vulnerable women mm -hmm. and teach them trades and things like that, kind of um, keep them off the streets, keep them in, in dignified work. Mm -hmm. um, and she really understood that the poor have a right to as good of an education and as good of health care as the wealthy do. Mm -hmm. But she understood that for that to happen, she needed to train her sisters to those advanced degrees. Mm -hmm. She needed to equip her sisters with what was necessary to provide that education. And so it's we see it as really our almsgiving to the church. You know, it's it's certainly formative not just in the work itself, but even like going through the studies, like that alone is a formation, mm -hmm. grueling sometimes. Right. Um, but, but then what that allows our community to be able to offer back to the poor, to be able to offer back to the church, mm -hmm. we see that as, as kind of an, our offering back to the church. So mm -hmm. it's, um, you know, people are impressed by it, but it's, Mm -hmm. It's not just for self-aggrandizement, you know, it's not sure. just to collect degrees, it's really to make that available to the people that need it. So. Right. Yeah, and I think one of the things that, that parents could take, for example, from this discussion is, I think, you know, I worked as a vocation director for mm -hmm. four and a half years in Austin, and I think parents are sometimes afraid to mention vocation to their child because they're thinking, if I mention it, it's going to plant something that's not real there, and then they'll have a neurosis or something, you know, <laughs> and uh, they won't be happy. But if you're, if you're a parent and you're a person of faith and you believe that God is the ultimate source of happiness, then to ask a child to consider a vocation can't go wrong in a sense. In other words, God doesn't trick people, as you say. Communities and dioceses are not in the business of tricking people either because it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. If you try to, to coerce someone into the religious life, you're going to have to live with that person five years later when they're sick of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? right. So you want people who are tested Mm -hmm. and who are truly 
have truly discerned that, yes, this is what God is calling me to. It's what will bring me happiness. So it becomes the source of happiness for the child, not a, mm-hmm. a block. I have had this thought before, though, that um, to the degree that we equate happiness with sex, which is natural for most people because most people are called to marriage, Mm -hmm. sex and family and that spousal relationship to the degree that we think, I couldn't be happy unless, you know, marriage is what would make me happy. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's correct. Most people are called to that, thus it seems natural that most people would in fact think that. But you have to make sure that you're not thinking that for someone else, Mm -hmm. because the fact is, uh, for Mm. people called to religious life, the thought of having done something else is kind of makes me sad. Mm -hmm. You know, you probably experienced that. Yeah. I think, you know, we live in a culture that's not real comfortable with uh, discipline (laughs) or self-sacrifice. And, and, I mean, there are some very faithful, Faithful people too, who, you know, have said that, you know, to to us or to our my sisters and I, you know, I just I couldn't I could never be a sister I could never be a priest because of X Y Z thing, mm-hmm. you know, and I just you know sometimes I reflect back to them because if I see that they're like a happily married person it's just like, well that might be true, but being a good husband requires an immense amount of sacrifice yep. being a good wife does being a good parent does like you're making sacrifices because of the the vocation that God has called you to mm-hmm. all the time if you're living your vocation well right and they don't always cue into that you know right. they like they know that it's hard <laughs> sometimes right. that being a parent can be hard and working out issues in your marriage it can be hard like they have that lived experience but the connection that these are sacrifices that they're making because of the vocation to which God has called them, they don't always see that connection. Right. You know, so it's just helping them, you know, to see that you make those sacrifices freely, even though it's not easy, you make them freely, you make them in a certain sense joyfully, because you recognize the good that God has called you to here, mm-hmm. and you're willing to make the sacrifice for those that you love. And that's the same thing God is doing with us. He's giving us the freedom, the internal freedom, the capacity, the courage, whatever you want to call it, to make the sacrifices that are necessary for our vocations, mm-hmm. you know, as as a religious sister or as a priest or a bishop or whatever, whatever the vocation is, the sacrifices look a little bit different, but you can't avoid sacrifice. It's just, mm-hmm. you know, acknowledging that the Lord knows what will bring us happiness and always the Lord's path is going to bring with it the cross. Mm-hmm. I mean, He did us a great um, favor in telling us that you know it wasn't going to be easy to live the Christian life, but but it's sort of paradoxically just so joyful. So, in love, I think is what causes it to not seem like a sacrifice. Mm-hmm. That's why I think people miss it. I used to have this conversation with engaged couples in. Uh, I would ask them about the rules. You know, they would talk about rules, and we we don't want to be involved in rules. There's no rules in our relationship. And I would test them a little bit and say, really? So you can date other people? You're Mm -hmm. you're free? No, no, no. Oh, it turns out there's a rule about that. Okay, so there's a rule about that. Um, Can you make plans for the weekend without checking in with the other? No, 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 no. Okay, so there's another mm-hmm. rule. So you, you you ask some questions, you see all of a sudden there's all these rules. So then the question, the interesting question is, why did they think there weren't any rules? They love each other, and so they don't experience those things as being rules. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's true for all of us. You mm-hmm. know, the more that we meet God, enter a relationship with God that is living and life-giving, that's not just... Um, passive, Mm -hmm. not just what I learned in grade school kind of thing, but it's something that I actually have experienced. You spoke of those experiences of God's presence in simple things, looking out a window Mm -hmm. and, you know, midnight in a chapel. Um, The more that that happens, the less we're going to experience 
uh, those kinds of things as being rules or sacrifices. Uh, today is that feast day of St. Uh, Thomas More. Tonight we celebrate the 50th anniversary of our parish, right. Santo Tomas Moro. Um, and today in the Office of Readings, we have that great letter from St. Thomas to his daughter, Meg. And so to everyone watching, if you have not watched A Man for All Seasons yet, it's how many years old, 100 years old now or something? If you haven't watched that yet, watch that movie. It's so well done. And it, it really captures that relationship between Thomas and his daughter. But in that letter, which I'm going to be quoting from in the homily tonight, um, Thomas says to his daughter that the king has done him a great favor in locking him up in the tower. He's been there for more than a year now. And he's saying, you know, so far, God has so disposed the king to be kind to me. All that he's taken from me so far is my liberty. Would most of us, having been unjustly locked up for a year in a tower, <laughs> be willing to say, the king is treating me well? Uh, and he talks about how it has been of great, tremendous spiritual benefit to him. But should God change that disposition in the king such that he actually harm him? Uh, Thomas says, I will not distrust God. He has been faithful to me till now, and he will not leave me behind. And so, yeah, that's a tremendous, uh, I think, a tremendous lesson for us as we talk about vocation and call and discernment is that love is at the heart of it, so there's nothing to fear in it. Mm. Uh, you can't do it wrong. You can take it too long sometimes. But, <laughs> uh, we, we talked about that when I was in campus ministry often, about uh, students who became professional discerners. <laughs> so, I'm constantly discerning. Yeah, but discernment is towards a decision, you know, once you, once you enter into it. And, and the other piece of it is it leads to a next step. And the next step will give you additional information. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to worry that I have to make a decision that's going to be for the rest of my life after one month in the convent mm -hmm. or something. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't work that way. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, feel, feel at ease to consider who is God for me. And uh, what do I want to do with my life? What part will God play in what I want to do with my life? Yeah, I think you mentioned, Jane, the, that word like planting, like parents don't want to plant something that's not there. But, you know, if the child's been baptized, the planting's already been done. You're just kind of helping it develop, mm -hmm. you know, figuring out. Father Pratt has used this kind of image, which I, I thought was good, you know, of like planting a seed and then... You know, you give it water, you give it sunshine, you know, it's like the sacraments, the the life of faith and prayer, and all of these things cause all the seeds to grow, mm -hmm. you know, and then it kind of grows and it sprouts, and, and then you give it more water and more sunshine, more fertilizer, whatever it is, and it keeps growing. And over time, you see what kind of thing it is, you know, what, what the vocation is. But meanwhile, you're nurturing it all yeah. along. But... But, for, you know, for parents to know, like, you can't plant a vocation that's not there, mm -hmm. really. You can only help the child to discover it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, it's not every child that's going to be, like, r really happy externally, at least, if their parent says, hey, I think you should consider a vocation to the priesthood or to mm -hmm. religious life. But I think there's something so beautiful about the priesthood, something so beautiful about religious life that... I imagine deep down there's still, even if the child doesn't initially want the vocation or kind of want to look at that, that the child understands the parent sees something of greatness in them, mm -hmm. you know? And like, like I'm the type of person they think could be a priest, mm -hmm. you know? I'm the type of person that could be a sister. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there's greatness in the, in the marriage vocation as well, but like, for kids to have a sense 
even if that ends up not being their vocation, but that the Lord is calling them to something great, mm-hmm. and God is calling them to be faithful and to be vibrant in their life of faith and in their relationship with Him. I think that alone speaks volumes, right. you know, mm-hmm. and teenagers aren't necessarily going to tell their par- their parents that. Right. Or, you know, the thank you might come, you know, 10 years later. Right. But I think it can't be underestimated the impact of of a parent's kind of trust and belief in their child, mm-hmm. you know, that like God can do great things through them. And, and I would say that the greatness is not related to the which call it is, mm-hmm. but to how it's lived. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, a person can be a priest who's kind of a slug, right? He He's ordained, but does he do anything with that? Mm-hmm. And he's going to be an unhappy person, and the same would be true for a religious, and the same would be true for a married person. On the other hand, a person who is doing this because they have this relationship with God that is living and and life-giving in them is seeking to please him in a way that is great. In other words, that's where that greatness comes from. I don't want to just survive through this. I want Mm -hmm. to to become a saint in yes, this. I want to thrive. I yeah. want to thrive. I've got a family. I want my family to be well served. You know, mm-hmm. I want to really give myself to them, mm-hmm. uh, my community. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're a motley crew, but they're my motley crew. <laughs> <laughs> so you've been hanging out of my house? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's my house. <laughs> exactly. Uh, well, it, Bishop, I thought you, uh, did you mention you wanted to? Uh, re- well, you know, what we're planning to do next next episode is to then talk some about an initiative that's going on, uh, it's about to start at St. Francis, that the diocese and St. Francis are working together on a clinic for natural procreative technology. Now, that's a term that many people may not be familiar with, they may be more familiar with the term NFP, natural family planning. But this this other term, I think, more accurately describes what has happened in the world of natural family planning is that there has been this uh, medical uh, discoveries of different procreative technologies which help couples to understand, to fully appreciate, to fully live out of their fertility as a couple. Uh, And this includes treating uh, medical conditions that can get in the way of fertility. So we'll be talking some about that because we're launching a clinic out of St. Francis Hospital soon uh, to help couples with this. But again, connecting it to this this uh, episode that we're doing on vocation and on discernment, uh, I wanted to share a homily from 2007. So this is all the way back when I was in campus ministry. It was given uh, during Natural Family Planning Week. So Mm. each year the USCCB sponsors a week when we focus on uh, the gift of fertility that God has given to marriage. And uh, what I was highlighting in this homily was how love is the center of all of these things. Love is the center of any vocation. Love is the ultimate foundation of a response to a vocation. And this is also true of marriage. I think couples sometimes imagine that it's the, the disturbed feeling in my stomach that I recognized as love of my spouse that's the heart of my marriage. No. That may be the beginning, Mm -hmm. but that's not going to be enough to make a marriage endure. It's the love that I have for God that transforms that kind of emotive love that may begin a relationship into something much deeper that we could call marital love. So let me just share this a little bit. And um, uh, that weekend we had, in the gospel, we had... um, the passage about Martha and Mary, Jesus' visit to the home of Lazarus and Martha and Mary. And you remember Mary, Martha is very busy and mad that Mary is just sitting around <laughs> dawdling at him uh, and uh, so forth. And uh, we had in the, the uh, Old Testament scripture the passage of Abraham, who welcomes the three strangers 
shows some hospitality and then discovers their God, that this is the Trinity come to visit him. Um, but those scriptures teach us about love and welcome, and the love of Martha and Mary is the motive uh, of their welcome to their friend Jesus. Um, Martha be welcomes him by being busy, attending to his human needs. Mary welcomes him by attending to the deeper mystery of who he is. She recognizes something deeper about him and wants to be attentive to that. Uh, Abraham uh, deals with the mystery when he welcomes these three strangers, and they turn out to have been God. We can also look at the theme of welcome in the relations that exist between a man and a woman, and between husband and wife. How many people have spent time in the walls of this church? I was, I was standing in the campus ministry church, mm -hmm. 50 years old at that time. Uh, how many people have spent time in these walls the last 50 years praying that God would grant them the gift of a good spouse? There were a lot of students praying <laughs> that God would grant them the gift of a good spouse. And how many couples have met, and as they begin to fall in love, even come to Mass here together and begin to share their hearts, their hopes, including their faith? I knew many couples whose first date was coming to Mass together. I knew one girl who would always bring her dates babysitting with her to a family that had a lot of kids so she could kind of scope out how they reacted. <laughs> how are you going to be for a dad? I'm a dad. <laughs> I thought that was pretty clever. How many prayers have gone up to God asking him to guide their relationships and to help them discern carefully and well? See, so at that point, we're dependent on God. We need God to help us. God, be with me. And how many weddings here over all these 50 years, celebrations of the covenant that exists between a husband and his wife and their God, how wise for a man and a woman on the day of their marriage to ask God to be with them every day and in every way through all the years that will unfold before them. Because at that point, anybody who's honest mm -hmm. is going to admit, we don't know what may happen. Right? I've always had the picture of, of the couple at the church on the wedding day getting on a boat, heading out to sea. What will happen? Don't know. Because I don't know, I'm inviting God to be with us. So marriage is all about welcome, about offering love and receiving love, and God is a full partner in the marriage. That's something for us to always emphasize to engaged couples, uh, that God is not in addition, mm. God is the very foundation, the very heart of it. Where else are they going to have what they need in the moment, in terms of virtues, strengths, the, the fortitude that we spoke of? So what Paul VI was saying to couples, because we were talking about Humanae Vitae. Humanae Vitae is an encyclical letter from Pope Paul VI, at the time was very controversial, in which the church continued to say that God's fidelity to the couple in their fertility is what we have to pursue, and that using contraceptives in marriage is contrary to the good of the marriage and of the spouses. So what Paul VI was saying to couples, what God is revealing to couples through the scriptures and through the church is to continue that offering, continue to offer that welcome to God that marked their lives before they met and while they were dating and preparing to marry. Don't do anything to exclude God from some part of the marriage to say to God that there is something that we won't offer to you or receive from you. That's what contraceptives ultimately do is they, the couple is not intending this, you probably, but the very act of using them is saying to God, there's something that we don't want you to have part in. We want to exclude you from some part of our life together. Uh, contraception by its very nature does this when it seeks to separate marital love from the possibility of children. But natural family planning, otherwise now we're calling natural procreative technology, by observing the mystery of God even in the fertility of the husband and wife, 
remains completely open to God's presence in every aspect of the marriage. God is seen as a cherished partner in the marriage, even in the marital lovemaking, as he directs the spouses, enlightening their minds and deepening the union of their hearts. To use NFP, you have to rely on God because he's with you. Every act of the marital, every use of the marital act does not result in the, the conception of a child. But when it does, that's, that's, not, <laughs> that's not normal. Hmm. I used to say to couples, every time that you conceive a child, you change the universe. Because whereas prior to the conception of that child, the universe didn't have that child, now the universe will never not have that person. You have changed the universe. God has given you the capacity to change the universe. That's an eternity. <laughs> you know that yeah. that to me is pretty amazing yeah it's incredible uh, the union this union of hearts is fruitful as god leaves behind his gifts these are the gifts that we see from couples who use uh nfp better communication deepening of their commitment greater understanding and respect for the body and for the gift and mystery of fertility growth and patience and emotional maturity takes all of those things mm -hmm. Greater holiness as they make God the head of the household, and when they sense the time is fulfilled, even the supreme gift of a child. So that's a that's a, a conversation that we were having way back in 07 at the student center with, with student. We did so many marriage preparation uh, couples, you know, mm -hmm. at a campus ministry. And uh, wanting to pass on to them the great gift of all of this. Uh, contraception is is a it, again we have to separate the intention of a couple and the use of a of something like contraception it's not that the couple is intending to be exclusive but that's what it actually is doing and so we don't want to exclude god we want to invite god and in the midst of that invitation god will do things with us that we could never foresee that's what happens in every vocation that's fulfilled whether it be a religious sister a priest a husband and father the more that we let god have his reign in our vocation the more he will do things with us that we never would have foreseen at the beginning absolutely yeah so we'll pick this up next week you, you'll hang out with us for another week i will hang out all right sounds great thank you so much for tuning in if this uh, episode relates to something that may be happening in your family or as you're discerning your vocation make sure to share it with others and uh, make sure to like and subscribe to the podcast we'll see you guys next week <laughs>